Hi, everyone. To the intimate crowd here in person and the many of you watching online, welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the museum, and it's a pleasure to kick off today's uh, celebration of 10 years of Recipes Remembered with author June Hirsch. This book, now a decade old, is really a stunning accomplishment and a true labor of love for June. Through the voices of the Holocaust survivors that the book features, uh, Recipes Remembered serves as a rare reflection of a rich and diverse patchwork of pre-war Jewish communities across Europe, a world that doesn't exist anymore, but is captured in the stories and the recipes that were carried by survivors out of that world into this one and then recorded on the page by June. This is a special treat because June's cookbook was published by the museum when it first came out, because the book features dozens of food-related artifacts from our collection, because the book sales generously support the museum's work, and because many of the survivors featured in the book are people who were and are treasured members of our community. And a special welcome goes out to all the survivors and everyone featured in the book who's with us today, either in person or online. Today, with more than 20,000 copies of Recipes Remembered sold so far, we celebrate the release of the book's 10th anniversary edition. Those of you here in person can purchase the book in either hardcover or paperback in the museum lobby after the program. And those of you watching online can order your copy at the link in the live stream chat. We'll hear from June in a moment who will share an inside look at the book and the voices it contains. After she speaks, sorry, as she speaks, you'll see stories and recipes from the new 10th anniversary edition scrolling on the screen behind her. After that, June and I will sit down for a conversation and we'll have an opportunity to take questions from the audience, so both in person and online. So as you listen to her talk, please be thinking of questions you might have. Without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to June Hirsch, author of Recipes Remembered. Well, first I want to thank Ari for his warm welcome and I want to thank and I think I can count them on my two hands, <laughs> those of you who are here in person. And from what I understand, there are enough of you online who could actually fill this hall. So uh, we are having a true COVID book talk. And I thank you so much for joining me, whether you're joining me in person or whether you're joining me online. This book has an incredibly special place in my heart. And I'm going to say that in speaking to people who own the book and have seen the book, they have taken it into their homes and their hearts as well. And the support that you have all shown over this past decade is just so gratifying to know that this book is resonating with so many people. It seems like yesterday, and I know it's a cliche to say that, but it truly seems like yesterday that I came to this museum. And for those of you who are live streaming and not physically here, if you have yet to come to this museum, oh my goodness, this has to be on your to-do list. Because the Museum of Jewish Heritage stands poised at the edge of Lower Manhattan. And its literal view matches perfectly with its philosophical view. And that is that on the one hand, they're looking at Ellis Island, a, a, a nod to our past, and on the other, they're facing the Statue of Liberty, which illuminates our future. And it's the melding of those two perspectives that really define this museum and what makes it such an important institution, especially in days like today. So 10 years ago, I walked through those doors. And 10 years ago, I had an idea for a book. And I'm going to try to turn this on. And that's on. And the idea for the book really came very organically because we were at a crossroads in our lives. My family, we had just sold our family business. And my very wise sister, who is waving and sitting out there right now, said to me, we did well. Now let's do good. And I was trying to think, what was my good going to be? How was I going to make a difference? Well, I love to eat. And out of necessity, I love to cook. 
And because of that, I knew whatever good I was going to do was going to absolutely involve food. So I also had a deep respect for this museum, having been here a number of times and having been a supporter of it with my family. And I came to the museum and I said, I want to put together a cookbook. And I want to feature the stories and recipes of Holocaust survivors. And I want to feature the foods that we need to preserve. I want to keep these stories alive. And just as importantly, I want to keep their food memories alive because everyone, we all know that food is just such a, a connecting topic that we can all conjure up a smell or a taste from a family holiday. And it's food that really was the bridge for many of the survivors between their lives before the war and their lives once they settled after. And I wanted to celebrate that. And it was interesting when we named the book Recipes Remembered a celebration of survival, some people said, this is a book on the Holocaust. A, how do you involve food in it? And B, or two, as my daughter would say, how do you call it a celebration? Look what these people went through. But they went through it, and they came out the other side, and they are strong, and they're resilient, and they're perseverant. And so we celebrate that survival. And that's really what this book is all about. So I came to the museum, and I met with the board of directors, and then the director, who is now director em emeritus, David Marwell. And I said to him, I have an idea. I want to write a cookbook. I want it to be about Holocaust survivors. They all looked aghast. And they said, what do you need us to do? And I said, you need to give me a list. You need to give me some names of people I can speak to, and I'll take it from there. And they said, and? I said, oh, and? I'll do all the work and all the writing and test all the recipes. And at the end of it, God willing, we'll have a beautiful book and we'll sell it to benefit the museum. Well, they loved the idea. Why not? And I walked out and I was elated. And then all of a sudden I said, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've never written a cookbook before. I don't really even know how to go about this. So I took a course at the new school. And if he's on our live stream, and I hope he is, Andy Smith, you are my literary guardian angel. And Andy guided me through the cookbook writing process. And what our next step was, once I kind of nailed the way to go about it, was to speak to a survivor. Now, I am not the child or grandchild of survivors. Well, I'm too old to be the grandchild of survivors. But I'm definitely not the child of survivors. And I had very little interaction until this project with the survivor community. So I was a little bit timid. And I spoke to one of the board members, uh, Evelyn Goldfire, who is just an amazing, amazing force. And Evelyn said, why don't you start with my mother, Regina? And thank goodness I did, because she was so receptive, and her attitude was so positive, and the way she approached the discussion we had was just so incredibly comforting to me that she put me at ease and I felt, okay, I can move forward with this project. So she came to my apartment and I prepared a little spread for her and Regina sat down and I will say right off the bat, I do the worst Middle Eastern accent you've ever heard. My son-in-law says it sounds like the Swedish chef on the Muppet show, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And I said to Regina, tell me a little bit about your story. Tell me about your experiences during the war. And she told me. And she told me about the people she lost. And she told me about the cousin that she found. And she told me how she came through a DP camp and, like, like many, met the love of her life and built a life together here in America and had a family, and shept nachis, and had what many of my survivors called the best revenge, because they lived a good life. And I heaved a sigh of relief, because I felt, okay, we got through the hard part. I've heard her story. 
the rest is going to be literally a piece of cake. We're going to talk about food. So I said, Regina, tell me, what is your signature recipe? And Regina looked at me and she said, what? What's a signature recipe? And I said, a signature recipe, it's something you always prepare, something that people identify with your cooking, that your family looks forward to. And she says, ah, oh, sweetheart, that's easy. I make kluski. And I said, kluski? She says, yes, it's a Polish dish. I make kluski. And I said, great. And I got out my pencil and my pad, and I said, tell me how you make it. She says, oh, mamala, it's easy. She says, you take a little flour and potatoes, you mix it, mix some, some eggs, and you have kluski. <laughs> and I said to her, well, maybe you have kluski if you do that. I don't think I'm going to have kluski if I do that. There have to be other ingredients. And Evelyn turned to me and she said, don't panic. I speak Regina. She says, Mom, when you go to the supermarket and you buy the potatoes for the kluski, how many potatoes do you buy? She says, well, if you think I have time to count the potatoes, you've got to be kidding. I buy a bag. And Evelyn said, and when you buy the bag, Mom, can you carry the bag, or does somebody else have to carry that bag for you? And Regina looks over her shoulder and looks around, and she says, well, last time I checked, I don't have anyone carrying bags of potatoes for me. She says, and when you get home, Mom, and you make the kluskis, how many potatoes do you have left in that bag? I had known Regina for maybe 45 minutes at this point, and I knew her answer to that. She says, if you think I would waste a single potato after what I went through in the war. You're crazy. I have no potatoes left. And with that, Evelyn looked at me and she said, five pounds of potatoes. That's how every single recipe unfolded. I was told, like all of us have been told from recipes from our parents and grandparents, a handful of this, a bit of that, the word in, in Yiddish is shitterine. Matter of fact, when I wrote the book and I used the word shitterine in it, the publisher said, we really don't think there should be any foul language in the book. And I said, no, 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 shitterine, it's fine. It's a Yiddish word. It basically means a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I laugh sometimes because I feel if I really wanted to make money for this museum, instead of selling the books, I would have sold Jewish cooking utensils. I would have had measuring spoons that say, abyssal, not enough, maybe too much, or you ruined the whole recipe. And that would have been my, my best product to sell. So we got through the recipe, we wrote it, and that's really the experience of collecting almost every dish in the book. I was told for one of the cakes that had eggs and matzo meal that you need to use an eggshell of matzo meal. A little egg, an extra large egg. So what did I do? I bought extra large eggs. I bought regular size eggs. I made the cake with an extra large eggshell of matzo meal. It was as dry as a bone. I made the cake with the small eggshell. It fell apart. I used a large egg at the end, and that's how I, I did that. At the end of all of these preparations, and it took about a year to taste and test every single recipe, I turned to my husband and I said, I think I'm done. And he said, good, because for one year we've eaten like 80-year-old Polish peasants. <laughs> and I've decided that's not such a bad thing. If you think about it, they were organic eaters before anybody knew what organic was. If it grew in the ground or it could last in the cellar, it was dinner. It was dinner from Monday night through Friday night, but it was dinner. And I found that as I was making some of these recipes, and they were new to me, that I was finding that some of them were actually cropping up on some very trendy menus. I went with my daughters to a restaurant in the West Village. They had on the menu toasted buckwheat groats with fafale, not fancy, fafale pasta and caramelized onions. They were selling kasha varnishka for about $16.95 a serving 
we all know it costs pennies to make it home. There were dishes that I was preparing, like pacha, calf jelly feet. I don't know if any of you have ever eaten jellied calf's feet. I'm sure some of you have tried it, or maybe your parents or grandparents made it. I got that particular recipe from Arthur Schwartz, a really well-known cooking, Jewish cooking expert. I made it in our house one day. It was a Sunday morning, I think. My husband's nodding, yes, it was a Sunday morning. He comes downstairs and he said, we're gonna have to sell the house. Whatever you're making, it's, it's awful. And I picked up the phone, because he was kind enough, Arthur, to give me his cell number, and I called him. And I said, Arthur, it smells like an animal died behind my stove. And without missing a beat, he said, oh, then it's ready. <laughs> That's my pacha. I went to people's homes, and I sat next to them in their kitchens. I I'll never forget going to one lovely woman, a blessed memory. And I went to her and I said, Angie, how do you make your matzo balls? You said that's your, your signature dish. She says, oh, sweetheart, it's so simple. She walks into her kitchen, she opened her cabinet, she took out a box of Manischewitz matzo ball mix, and she says, this is now how I make my matzo balls. Had so many wonderful experiences. Went to one woman's home that I will never forget. She had a beautiful apartment and she looked over the East River and we were sitting there and her husband was very shyly sitting next to her on the couch and she kept saying, tell her, tell June how amazing my kugel is. Nothing. Tell, tell June how wonderful my citrus pudding is. Nothing. And then I started to notice her elbow protruding into his ribs. And finally, he chimed in. He says, oh, yes, yes, no, 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 the best. It's the absolute best, because everybody's recipe, you know, was the best that I had ever tried. And this was the best noodle pudding I was ever going to have. And when we were all done, her husband said, can I walk you out? And I said, sure. He says, I need to tell you three things. I said, oh, sure, go ahead. The first, to be honest, was a dirty joke. Don't remember it, but I blushed like crazy. The second, he says, she doesn't know it, but I'm six years older than she thinks I am. Why he felt the need to share this with me, no clue. And the third, he says, whatever you do, don't make her recipe. It's awful. <laughs> and I said, but you told me it was the best. He says, well, what did you want me to do? She was digging her elbow into my side. He says, whatever you do, don't put that in the book. Call her, email her, figure out something else, tell her you already have four recipes like that, and get a new recipe from her. He says, because trust me, you're not going to want to make it. I made baby biscuits, which were delicious, after we figured out something when I called the wonderful survivor who gave me her recipe, and she said to me, oh, Mamala, didn't I tell you? You have to dunk them in tea for a few minutes before you eat them. Otherwise, you're going to break a tooth. It was information like this that is filled in the book, and recipes that are as diverse as the survivors themselves, because we all think that this is just Oh, the typical Ashkenazi dishes that the cookbook is filled with, matzo ball soup and brisket, and it is, and other dishes that we associate with Jewish cooking. But it's also filled with Sephardic recipes, which speaks to part of my heritage, and those were robust, filled with dill and parsley and lemon and garlic, and my kitchen all of a sudden went from beige to yellow and green, and it, it was very vibrant. And there were also recipes from Jewish cooks who found themselves in places as far off as the Dominican Republic and Argentina and Shanghai. And so one of the things that I really love about the book is that not only does it recreate and represent these unbelievable, timeless, traditional recipes that are paired with a story <laughs> that will just, it's a combination of melting your heart and tearing out your heart, but at the end of the day, we laughed more than we cried. But it has such significance and such meaning. So what I'm hoping, and I, I shamelessly 
sell this book because none of its proceeds go to anything that I'm wearing or, or on my fingers or my toes. Everything goes to support charitable causes, particularly the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So I am so obvious about telling you that you should be bringing this book into your home, you should be sharing it with friends and family, not sharing your one copy, mind you, but sharing the stories, sharing the recipes, and encouraging others to have this book because it's, it's our obligation to keep these stories alive and to keep these recipes alive. Every year at Passover, I make a chocolate mousse made by that woman's mom. And every time that I make it, I think about her mother and her story, about how she went to Paris to escape where she was in, I think, Chernovitz in Romania. And I make this mousse. And it, it's not that the mousse is not fabulous, because it is, but the story that goes with it makes it even more satisfying. So at the end of the day, I always say the same comment. And I'm saying it to the people who are here, many of you already own the book, and to the people who are watching on live stream. You don't cook, I don't care. You've turned your kitchen into a gym, your children are now gluten-free vegans, your grandchildren will only eat foods on odd days of the week, doesn't matter to me. This book is a book that should be on your night table, like some people have it. It's a book that should be in your home. And I hope you embrace it in the spirit that I think it really deserves. So is it a storybook filled with recipes or a recipe book filled with stories? And I'm going to say it's a recipe book filled with stories because the stories are at the heart of this book. The stories are what makes this book so important. And especially at a time like this, I find that the perspective you can gain from speaking to a survivor or hearing their story, and unfortunately, we're losing them way too fast right now. I would say probably about a third of the people who are in this book are no longer here. And we really need to tell these stories. So I'll share a few of them with you. I remember going to Mary Mayer's house. And I remember it was a snowy day. And I pulled onto her driveway. And she said to me, oh, Mama, I'm so sorry I dragged you out in this weather. It's, it's awful. And I don't even have a story to tell. And I said, oh, Mary, everybody has a story to tell. Three hours later, I left Mary's with a care package of the most perfect Linzer tarts you'd ever want to eat, and a story that I remind myself of, especially in these last 18 months, because it gives you such a sense of perspective. Mary grew up in a very privileged home in Hungary. She went to boarding school. She was actually in Switzerland when the war came to Europe. And I think her family must have felt that it was safe because the war came to Hungary later than it did most places. And she came back home from school, and next thing she knew, her world was turned upside down. And she was able to use the identity of her nanny's daughter, which for the nanny was tantamount to treason, and she could have lost her life for having given these papers to Mary. And Mary boarded a train, and she went from the Buddha side to the Pesh side in Hungary. And she found a job working as a farmhand. This is a girl who went from a private school and a governess, and she's now about 16 years old, and she's working as a farmhand. But she was safe. Her mother was actually in the protection of Raoul Wallenberg at the time. So she knew her mother hopefully was safe as well. And Mary worked there for about a year or two, and she said one day she was up in the attic and she looked out the window and she saw a tank coming down the street. And she said, this is it. We're done. And she walked outside and she turned to the commander who was on the tank. And in perfect German, she was Hungarian, in perfect German she said, welcome to our village. And in Russian, the commander answered and he said, we are not German, 
we are here to liberate your town. And with that, in Russian, she answered, I'm Jewish, take me home. And she reached out her hand, and he pulled her up onto the tank. And he drove her to the edge of the Danube River. The bridge that connected the two sides had been destroyed. And I said, Mary, what did you do? How did you get home? And she says, oh, it wasn't a big deal. I waited for winter, and I walked across the frozen Danube. I was inconvenienced coming down the west side highway because the car in front of me was going a little slower than my husband and I would have liked. She waited for winter and walked across the frozen Danube. That's perspective. We're complaining about masks. We're complaining about lots of things these days. I doubt any of us have ever had to endure what Mary or the other survivors in this book endured. And they came out the other end, and they lived good, productive lives. I tell the story about Celia Kenner. And Celia, I think you're watching on live stream, and I hope so, because I tell your story all the time. Because the same spunk that you have now, I can absolutely picture you having when you were a child. And she was taken from a playground because her friends called her out as a Jewish girl. And she was hoisted onto a truck. And she turned to the driver. Imagine, six years old. My kids at six years old, honestly, can't figure out how to turn on Netflix. And at six years old, she figured out how to say the head of the, the truck driver, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Let me off this truck. And I think he was afraid that she was a rabble rouser and was going to cause a bigger problem, and he did. He pushed her off the truck, presumably saving her life. And she ended up in the ghetto with her aunt and her uncle, and I believe some cousins as well. And her mom found work outside the ghetto. And her mother would come in occasionally and check on her and give her information and make sure that she was safe. And her mother learned that the ghetto was going to be liquidated. And she warned them. And everybody hid. And her aunt and uncle and cousins hid in one area. And Celia hid by herself. I actually have chills because I can hear Celia's voice telling me that she heard them rounding up everyone in the street. And she heard her aunt's voice distinctly say, Celia, survive and tell our story. And she did. And her mother got her out of that ghetto. And she went to a farmhouse in the woods. And a Christian couple took care of her. And no, she didn't see daylight. And she never left that room. And she was probably subsisting on a very small amount of food. But she was safe until the Germans came in, the Nazis came in, and they killed a neighbor. They hung him for harboring a Jewish child. And the woman of this household said, I can't take that risk. I, I can't risk my family's life to save yours. And she was ready to send Celia to an orphanage, but she didn't. Instead, she said to her, I'm going to send you to the barn. I'm going to bring food for you every three days. I hope to God it's enough. She says, and I just want you to know, there's someone else in the barn. She's not doing well. She's been there for nine months. And Celia went into the barn, and she climbed up the rafters, and she looked up at the top, and the woman who had been there for nine months suffering was her mother. And she was now reunited with her mom. And Celia, now probably seven, maybe eight years old, climbed down that rafter every third day, and she fed herself and her mother the rations that the woman was leaving for the animals. And together, they walked out of that barn. And Celia, or Gigi as her grandchildren call her, she is an amazing cook and an amazing woman. And it's the spirit that she has, the spirit that people like some of my survivors who I speak to on a regular basis, 
I had spoken to Sally Rosencrantz, uh, a blessed memory, and Regina, and Celia I speak to, and Perry Hirsch, and so many others have imbued me, and they can do the same for you with just such a sense of hope. I believe this whole book is about Bishert. It's about meant to be's. I believe to my core that I was meant to write this book. I believe that the way it came about was completely accidental in an accidental meeting of my sister and a woman who was a development uh, director here. But it was Bichert. It was meant to be that they'd meet. It was meant to be that I would come into this museum and write this book and have it truly change my life. And one of the stories that I think encapsulates the Bichert of this book almost more than any other story in the book would have to be the story about Nadia and Ada. Nadia and Ada were two women from the same small town in Poland. They were two women who found themselves together in Auschwitz. They were two women who were part of the only uprising ever to have taken place in Auschwitz or in any camp. These two women worked with a group of women in an underground plot to blow up a crematorium. Imagine, what were they thinking? And I wear a dress to every single book talk I've ever given for this one moment because they lifted the hem of their dress and they opened up a stitch and they put gunpowder in that hem. And every night as they came home from work in the munitions factory, they deposited a few granules at a time of gunpowder. Well, eventually, enough of these women did this, and the woman who was the ringleader, the organizer, was hung in the center of Auschwitz as an example because they knew that she was working on a plot. They didn't know what, and she didn't give up a single person, and she certainly didn't share what their plans were. And these women took that gunpowder, and they passed it to the Sonder Commando, the men, the Jewish men, who had the awful task of running the crematorium. And they blew it up. And they killed a number of Nazis. And they paralyzed their operations for a short time. And maybe even more importantly, a lot of historians credit that moment with the undoing of the Nazi psyche that they would be able to be invincible. They started to realize that if survivors in the camps, if these, you know, infirmed and underfed people were able to blow up a crematorium, what else might they be capable of? It was their undoing. And these two women walked out of Auschwitz and they did not see each other again. Of course they saw each other again. That would be an awful ending to a book talk if they never saw each other again. So they bumped into each other in New York City. Now, many of us live in Manhattan. I can count on one hand the number of times I bump into the same person on the streets of New York. But Ada and Nazia bumped into each other, and they rekindled their friendship. Because what we found in speaking to survivors is is that when you lose your entire family, when you lose all of this, you make family where you can. And they became each other's family. And one day, one of them had to move. And they moved clear across the country to California. And there was a granddaughter. And the granddaughter, Jolie, out in California, she decided to go to school back east. And when she was there, she met a very nice young man at Ithaca College, and his name was Jason. And Jason and Jolie began to date, and they began to do more than date. And when Jason mentioned to his mother who he was dating, she said, oh my God, because one of them was Nadia's granddaughter, and Jason was Ada's grandson. You just can't make that up. 
both grandmothers lived long enough to know that they were serious. One of them lived long enough to see them engaged. And neither of them were there when Jason and Jolie had twins. One they named for Nadzia and the other for Ada. That's Beshert. That's meant to be. I was meant to write this book. You were meant to hear about it. This museum was meant to open its doors and to welcome people to learn about tolerance, now more than ever, how crucial it is. This book, 10th anniversary, I expect all of us to be here in 10 years from now to celebrate its 20th and 10 years after that. I thank you so much for listening and for being here and for being online. Thank you. June, that was terrific. Thank you so much for sharing the story of the book with us and some of the stories in the book with Thank us. Thank you. To be quite honest, I share this book with people in the ladies' room. So sharing it with people actually here in the museum is just an honor. <laughs> um, well, we'll definitely, the invitation is open for the 20th anniversary, and I hope to see you all there as well. Uh, I'm going to ask June some questions now, and we'll open the floor to audience questions as well. So um, in about 10 to 15 minutes, um, we'll turn to the audience, and you can raise your hands if you're in the room or share your questions in the YouTube chat if you're with us online. June, I want to start by asking about that anniversary. So it's, it's a very different world now than it was when you started this project 10 years ago. Tragically, some of the survivors are not with us anymore, but it's different in a lot of other ways. How do you look on, towards the project differently now than you did when you started? In my mind, this project was written at a time where it was almost convenient to write a book like this. It was easy. I had the time, and things were wonderful, and the world was rosy and cheerful, and everything was good. Ten years later, we're not in the exact same situation. And I think now more than ever, a book that teaches us these lessons, teaches us about tolerance, teaches us about what you can endure and how you can turn tragedy into triumph, is never more important. So I look at this and I say, it's a whole new generation to learn about this time in history with those who are saying <laughs> it never happened, with the rise in anti-Semitism, with the, the mood of the world. The time is right for this book right now, more than it was even 10 years ago. I think one of the things that's also different now uh, but if you disagree, let's talk about it, <laughs> is that there's sort of a revival of Jewish cuisine in the, in the popular sphere. All, especially here in New York, there are so many new Israeli restaurants, Jewish fusion restaurants, Yiddish fusion restaurants that have popped up, and they're really good, and they're popular. What do you make of that revival of Jewish food right now, and how does it connect to the book? Well, I think it is no different than all of a sudden we have a lot of grandchildren named Sophie and Esther. Um, I have a grandson, Henry. You, the, what's old is new again, and I think everybody is looking for those roots. It's just really important for us to connect with our heritage, whatever your heritage is. Connect with it, because it gives you a foundation. It gives you grounding, and I think the revival of the food, and you're right, I mean, uh, the first kosher restaurant is just opened in Greenwich, Greenwich and Delancey, just open. I mean, Greenwich, Connecticut, ready for a kosher restaurant, sure. I think there is a time now where we are all trying to find authenticity in our lives. We're trying to find experiences that speak to who we really are, or maybe for some people, honestly, what they're searching for or what they hope to be. And connecting with your history, with your past, is absolutely the best way to chart your course for your future. So I think that's really where that ties in. Hmm. I, I live near one of these great new Israeli restaurants. It's called Balabusta, which is <laughs> one of the words in the Yiddish glossary in the book. 
And um, for me, it's, it's particularly cool to visit these places, it, to eat at these pl restaurants, because it feels like a way of connecting with a sort of mythic Jewish past, which I think is a different experience for someone of my generation walking into a Jewish restaurant in New York today than maybe someone of your generation. What's great about Recipes Remembered is it's not connecting us with a mythic past through food, but to real people and real stories. And so the way that you pair a story with a recipe adds so many layers of meaning. Well, I mean, there's one woman in the book, Ida, and she shared a Passover recipe with me. What was the centerpiece on her Passover table? Sitting in the middle of Ida's Seder plate is a um, unexploded and hopefully cannot detonate um, I don't know if it's a bullet, I don't know how you would describe it, but it sits on her Seder plate because it's, it's what she took with her when she left, when she was liberated from the work camp that she was in. Well, you make her Passover recipe and then you read the story about what she brought forth with her. It connects the two so beautifully. I mean, it's just, I agree with you. One without the other just doesn't have the same impact. Incomplete, yeah. So one of the words in the Yiddish glossary is balabusta. Another is shidarine, which we talked about to, to cook without precision. Can you share some of the other Yiddish terms that sort of illustrate the story of the book? Well, um, I'm going to say there were a lot of menches in the book. And uh, I have a, a main mensch who cleaned up after I cooked every single recipe. Um, so I found that that was uh, a word I heard over and over. Uh, the word tom that it just has a good taste. There, there are certain Yiddish words that you really, you are, first of all, you need your hand to explain because as you can see, I can't say the word Tom without my doing this, which I'm not sure why, but it seems to be an involuntary reflex. How's this? Okay, there you go, that <laughs> works. And so, you know, the Yiddish words just it came flowing out. What, what was interesting is, is is that some of the survivors spoke Yiddish much better than others. I mean, my Sephardic survivors didn't speak Yiddish at all. And they actually said, and it's, it, it's not directly to your question, but I found it fascinating that when the survivors from Greece, and my family is from Rhodes, and there were a number of survivors from Rhodes who I met and are in the book, and when they actually went to Auschwitz at the very, very, very end of the war, and I mean, really in the last few months, and they were really just ushered there immediately, they were shunned by the Polish survivors in the camp because they did not speak Yiddish. And Yiddish was a, a, it was a commonality for them. It was a way to connect people from different towns. It was a way to again, sort of make a family where there was none. And so the Yiddish language, again, it's, it's something that unfortunately we're losing, and um, which is why I put a Yiddish glossary in the book, because I hope that at least those words will continue to be part of our, um, our lexicon. It adds a lot, and it helps us as readers envision the survivors communicating the recipes to you. Yes, and I will say, and I, I had a disclaimer, there are a dozen ways. You think Hanukkah can spe be spelled a number of ways? You don't begin to know how many different ways all of these words can be spelled. I picked one source, and that was the way I spelled it according to that particular source, but I have heard from so many, oh, there's no C in mensch, there's no T in mensch, there's no E in balabuzza. You can interpret them however you like, but use them. They're colorful. Overall, what differences did you notice in the recipes that you gathered from Ashkenazi survivors versus Sephardic survivors? Well, let's just say that I was much more familiar with the Ashkenazi recipes, having my mom who prepared the holidays primarily. Uh, I, I liken it, and I'm getting ready this weekend to make my matzo balls for Rosh Hashanah, and everyone who makes them knows you have either floaters or sinkers and matzo balls. Now, my mother's matzo balls were sinkers. They l stayed in your stomach from the day Passover began. You knew Passover was over because you passed the matzo balls. That was our barometer took good seven, eight days. That's an Ashkenazi food. It's beige. It's a little bland. It doesn't have as much tom to it. It's, it's simpler food. It's cabbage. It's potatoes. It's cheese. It's, um, it's delicious, and it's yummy, and it's what we all grew up on. But then all of a sudden, 
boom, in my kitchen came Sephardic food, which I was familiar with from my father's side of the family. And now I was seasoning uh, lentil soup with balsamic vinegar, which is truly one of the best recipes in the book. And it's the whole key to what Sephardic cooks call that zing. There's now lemon zest. Uh, somebody I know might have actually tried to go to a supermarket and buy lemon zest in a jar. And she's raising her hand right now. But lemon zest is something that Sephardic cooks use a lot of. They use busloads of parsley and dill. The influences of Sephardic cooking are very Mediterranean. So you, you're not cooking with chicken fat, you're cooking with olive oil. You know, and, and you're not using cabbage. Um, instead, maybe you're using grape leaves. And there, there's a whole different approach to the cooking. It, it was a lot of fun to alternate between the two and experience both. When I would make a, a July 4th barbecue, my family used to say, just tell us you're not serving only Holocaust food for July 4th. And I'd say, no, you'd be surprised. There are some recipes that work. It was interesting to integrate them into my own cooking. You know, your book is, in a sense, a really New York book because this is the place that the most Holocaust survivors came to in the United States, and they came from all over Europe, and they brought their recipes and their stories with them. And, and the, so we now have in our city the patchwork of places that they came from. And I was thinking as I listened to you that there's sort of an Israeli version of this, which is the dozens of countries across the Middle East and North Africa that Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews fled from after the State of Israel was established. And they brought their recipes mm -hmm. with them to Israel. And like a lot of the pre-war Holocaust communities that you commemorate in this book, a lot of those communities in the Middle East don't exist anymore. So I hope someone, whether it's you or an Israeli chef creates a version of this because it's a story that can be told in, for, in different ways. And I'm going to say because the museum honors not only the struggle of Jewish survivors, but we give a nod to any group of people who have experienced this kind of intense hatred and genocide and have gone through it, whether they be Armenian or from Darfur, and, and you have people from all different cultures, and what's so interesting is what has survived along with them is their food, and that's what they do bring forth, and it is their connection. It is the way they bridge that gap between their past and their, their present and hopefully their future. It's, it's, it's a thread. It just weaves through our lives. Judah, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll turn to the audience. How has the book changed your life in the 10 years <laughs> since the publication? I mean that generally, and I want you to tell that great story you said about your personal <laughs> Bechert. Well, um, I, I emphasize, and I said it very recently to one of my friends who is here, that this book and this project is so not about me. It's all about the survivors in the book, but I will say there's this one very important story and aspect that really is about our family, and um, that comes from what I felt was my own personal beshert um, from this book that um, was life-changing for us, and that story is that when I was researching the book, and those of you who own it know this, and those of you who are going to buy it uh, will find out that I included some celebrity chefs in the book. And it was a controversial decision. And I did it for really two reasons. One, I felt that maybe it would make the book, to be honest, marketable, and that we would get it into more hands and maybe get more coverage. And the other was that I felt that there were some recipes that maybe I was struggling with to recreate, and I could tap some professional chefs. And so I did that. And we have people like Ina Garten in the book, and Mark Bittman, and Mark Straussman, and uh, uh, Jonathan Waxman, and some truly gifted chefs. And one of them is a young lady named Jennifer Abadi, and she wrote a book called A Fistful of Lentils. And I found her book in the bookstore here at the museum. And I reached out to her, and to make a long story short, which I think you probably have already gotten the gist, I'm really not good at, but to make a long story short, we met up with each other in my home, and I prepared for her one of my family's traditional Sephardic dishes so that she could learn how to make it for a cookbook she was writing about Sephardic Passover recipes. And she took... Uh, copious notes, and she also kept a video recording going during the whole process. 
And in it, I might have mentioned at the time that I had a 26-year-old daughter who maybe was single, and did she possibly know any nice young men? And she might have casually dropped a name that she had a brother who she believes was unattached, and he fit her criteria. What was that criteria? He had to be smart, he had to be funny, he had to be tall, and he had to be Jewish. He fit those four things. Everything else was kind of negotiable. And I, we recorded my litany of criteria. Anyway, I passed that on to my daughter, and I said, would you like to meet this young man? And she said, yeah, if he wants to give me a call. Flash forward. She is married to him. It will be 10 years this coming June, and they are the parents of two of my three grandchildren. So that was our personal beshert from this book, because had I not walked into that bookstore and gotten her name, I don't know if they ever would have met. So that's why I say I think this book is all about meant to be's. That's so beautiful, June. And another reason to explore our museum shop. <laughs> we'll turn to audience questions now. Does anyone in the room have a question for June? Yes, the gentleman in the front here. Uh, my colleague, Sydney, will bring a microphone over. I'm wondering if you have a, uh, a recipe that uh, you find to be the most special or the one that uh, you bring out when you really need to show off your cooking skills. <laughs> and the one that you clean up the most after? Well, uh, I'm going to give you a real politically correct answer. Seeing as though everybody who gave me a recipe for this book told me it was the best version that I would ever eat of that particular dish, I'm going to stand by that, and I'm going to say that I find that some of the best recipes for me are the ones that I connect to the experience that I had with that survivor or with that child of a survivor. Um, if you want a definite go-to, I swear by that lentil soup. There's a barbecued brisket, which is so unexpected that my friend is nodding. She makes it every year for the holiday. It's truly yummy. And some of the more unusual dishes that I'm going to make this year for the first time, a roast campolio. Doesn't sound like a Jewish dish, but because Jewish people were thrown out of every good cooking country on the planet, we have really good cooking skills. And this woman gave me a recipe from the Dominican Republic where she prepared a roast campolio. Is that a Jewish dish? Well, literally, in my book, it is, because it was prepared by a Jewish woman for her Jewish holiday, and I'm going to make that this year. It's foolproof, and it's got all your veggies in it and all your grains. There was a wonderful recipe that's wonderful, not because the dish is necessarily the most standout, but the story that went with it. I interviewed a woman who had just had a stroke, a survivor who came across um, before the war actually progressed, and she and her family were lucky to get out. And she was having tremendous difficulty articulating some of the things she wanted to tell me, one of them being an ingredient. And she kept trying to say it, and her kids were there, and none of us could pull this out of her. And I had a vague sense of it, but it made no real sense until about a month later, I went to the home of a woman, Rini, again, a blessed memory, and Rini and I were talking, and I mentioned this woman, and I mentioned the town she was from, and Rini said, that's the town I'm from, and I said, Rini, maybe you can help me. There's a word that she was struggling to get out, and I said it, and she says, oh, you mean Grunkern, and I said, yes. Grunkern, I think that's what she was trying to say. And she turned to her husband and she said, get up on the step stool, up in the top shelf in the far left. And she pulled down a box of Grunkern. And we made a soup out of it. Is it the best soup I ever ate? Maybe, because it's one of the best stories I ever heard. Thanks for sharing that, June. Let's turn to this question. Uh, how do you define Jewish food? <laughs> well. 
<laughs> Jewish food to me is any food made by a Jewish person for a Jewish occasion. <laughs> and that's really how I define Jewish food. I define it as being food that is nourishing and nurturing. I find Jewish food is like a hug. It just sort of envelops you and stays there. Oh yeah, some of it lingers, but it stays there and it makes you feel warm and it makes you feel good. That's Jewish food to me. And it's authentic. It, it has a history. If Jewish food is like a hug, I don't know if I could put gefilte fish in that category. <laughs> <laughs> but I know some of you love it. I will say I failed at making gefilte fish for the book. It is the only recipe that I made again and again and again. And it, I did not, it just did not turn out. Now, I will say that many times when a recipe did not turn out, I would call the survivor and I would say, I don't understand it. The lemon curd, it, it just didn't turn out the way you described it to me. And they would say, did I tell you to chill it in the refrigerator for four hours before you put it in the mold? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, ah, I left that detail out. Now, I began to learn after 150 interviews, there was no accident with leaving out an ingredient or an instruction. I was convinced that there was a little bit of sabotage in that, not sure I want you to be able to make it exactly the way I do. And so there was a, a little essence of that in it. But um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, we are, there's a lot of nice comments. These aren't questions, but I'll just share that there's some lovely comments in the YouTube chat, including some um, folks from Ruderfin Press who are sharing their celebration. Oh, for this could occasion. you tell me who that is? <laughs> yeah, of course, Andrew Smith and Susan Slack are sharing well, best wishes. Andrew, you got a shout out earlier because Andrew is the one who brought the book to Ruderfin, and oh my goodness, Susan Slack, I cannot thank you enough. You are the reason this book looks the way it does. You are the reason this book ever got to print, ever got to press. You were a champion from this book from the day we met. I don't know if David Finn is still on this planet, but his spirit would have to be because he imbued everyone at Ruderfin Press, which, was a, uh, which is a PR firm that chooses one not-for-profit, one charitable project a year and the day before I was almost ready to self-publish the book and sort of throw the towel in Andy Smith said wait I've connected with Susan Slack and he brought me and my husband to Ruderfin and 10 years ago and the rest truly is history so thank you June it's such a pleasure to speak with you and celebrate the 10th anniversary edition of the book here all of you in person, if you don't already have the book, are welcome to buy a copy in the lobby or get your copy signed by June afterwards. All of you watching online can order Recipes Remembered, a celebration of survival at the link in the YouTube live stream. We'll see you all for the 20th. Thanks for being here. Thank you.